Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. And Lord, I just want to say thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Lord, I just pray and lift up all of these prayer requests to you that have been named. And Lord, I just pray for those who need health, that you'll touch their body, that you'll use the medicine or that is being administered. And I pray that you'd bless that to their body, Lord, as well. And now, Lord, we just pray and thank you for being a God that hears our prayers, that answers our prayers. And Lord, I know that you answer them sometimes completely differently than, than we expect. But Lord, we just thank you that we can come to you, that we have you. And that, Lord, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And again, we can say with confidence, the Lord is our helper. And, Lord, I just pray that you'll help each and every one of them with their appointments. I pray, Lord, for those that are traveling, that you'll just give them safety. I pray that you'll bless their, their trips. I pray that you'll bless the fellowship. I pray that you'll open up doors for all of us to be a witness to you, for you, Lord, and that souls will be saved, lives will be touched and changed. I pray, Lord, also, and thank you for these that are here and how they serve behind the scenes. I just richly pray that you richly bless them. I pray that you'll answer each and every one of their petitions according to your will. And, Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here today that's lost, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, maybe they're deceived or duped, I pray that you would pull the blindfold off their mind and heart and grant them genuine God-given repentance where they'll turn from their sin and put their trust in your son Jesus who died on the cross for their sins, all their sins, and that was raised from the dead on the third day. Lord, grant them understanding. Lord, bring conviction to sin. Lord, help them to see the righteousness that's found in you. And Lord, convince them of the judgment to come. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, well, you know what? I was going to ask if anybody was hot, but that might be a loaded question. <laughs> can, I, can I click one on? Okay. Are, are you guys kind of warm? Oh, hey. That means two. <laughs> all right okay all right who can tell me right off the bat what the book of galatians is about what is paul the apostle writing and warning these believers about does anybody know i'll give you a hint it starts with an l he's fighting legalism true legalism is what? What is true legalism? Hey guys, we're in Galatians chapter 6. No worries, no worries. Galatians chapter 6. True legalism. What is true legalism? It's poison. It'll send you to hell. Why? Yes, because you, in other words, you're taking what Jesus Christ did, which is perfect sacrifice. Nothing added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. It's perfect. Amen? And legalism is saying, and this his controversy was, you know, people eating uh, meat with blood, uh, being circumcised was the thing of the day. Now, you have to believe in Jesus plus be circumcised to be saved. No. That's the same thing as saying you have to be, uh, you got to believe in Jesus plus be baptized. Or plus go into a booth and confess your sins to a man that's just as wicked and sinful as everybody else on the planet. Amen? He's a sinner just like everybody else. The Pope needs to get saved just like everybody else. Just like Mary needs to get saved just like everybody else. Amen? Only one perfect person, and that's who? Period. Jesus. Amen? So, he's warning them and cautioning them, listen, it is Christ alone. It is faith alone. It's in Scripture alone. Period. You cannot add one atom of yourself to anything that Jesus has done. Jesus plus nothing is salvation. Jesus plus anything, anything, no matter how small it is that you add to it, is damnation. You get saved by putting your full trust, your whole soul, your complete trust in Jesus Christ. You're completely leaning on him to save your soul. Let me put it to you this way. Charles Spurgeon had a great illustration. He said, if somebody's drowning and they see a boat, and they can see the life buoy in the boat. They have knowledge that the boat's there, that boat's there to help them. They have knowledge of the fact that that little round donut that has a rope on it, boy, they can grab hold of that, man, and they're going to be saved. Now, does the knowledge of that save them, just having the knowledge of that? No, it doesn't. There's a lot of people that have a bunch of facts in their head about Jesus, but they're empty in their heart. Boy, yes, indeed. What does that person have to do? You can throw it out there to them. Does that save them? Just because you throw it out there to them? Now, they, they've got to grab hold of that with everything in them, right? You've got to hold on to Christ completely, 100%. Vulnerable, 
void of any earthly props, void of anything human that's going on. You are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So this is, this is the, 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 the biggest battle that was going on here in Galatians, and he was trying to wake them up so that they wouldn't be duped and deceived. Then we get to Galatians chapter 6, and let's read what it says. It says, Brethren, if a man, a woman, or a person be overtaken in a fault, a sin, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, least thou also be tempted. Boy, let's read that part again. Considering yourself, least you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove or test his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth unto his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit of the Holy Spirit will reap, will reap everlasting life. Hmm. All right. So, before the world was, what do you think in the eternal council of the Holy Trinity was going on in their heart? What was in the heart of God before, just before he created the world? What was in it? Love, of course, because he is love. God is love. Amen. Reconciliation. That was in his heart. The Bible says that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. Because it says that if he had to die for every sin, he would have to often come. Could you imagine that? That's why he came one time forever, and God downloaded every single solitary sin from Adam to the last person to ever be created. All of their sins were placed on Christ on the cross, according to Peter, that he bore our sin in his body on the tree. Boy, think about that. Man, so reconciliation was in the heart of God. He wanted to reconcile himself to us. And Hebrews chapter 12 explains that love is what? Every child the Lord receives, he rebukes and he scourges, right? If you be without chastisement, you're what? Without, you're illegitimate. You don't belong to God. So true love has what in it? Discipline. You know, you, you, you don't have, there's not discipline in somebody's life. That's not true love. Love is primarily an action, not an emotion. Amen? Boy, it really is. I mean, you ask the people of the world today to define love, you'll get 50 different answers. The Bible defines love as God is love. When you study God, you'll see perfect love. Amen? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 25. That there should be no division in the body, but that the members of that body should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Wow. So God wants us to get along. Amen. Just like he wants to be reconciled to us, guess what? He wants us also to be reconciled to those that we're not reconciled with. That's a huge thing with the Lord, and we're going to see that as we move through this. So if you were to entitle this, you know, like reconciliation and restoration, you can entitle it how to get along, how God wants you to get along, God's plan for you to get along in this world with other people, other believers, and even those that are hostile against you. Are you with me? So God wants his church pure, and he wants it holy. Amen. Would you agree with that? Why, why would you agree with that? Tell me why. Because he's pure and holy, right? Can't have fellowship with evil? Absolutely. Can you give me an example of a couple that messed up in church and God showed the whole world to end their church? We're not, I'm not playing games when it comes to sin in the church. Ananias and Sapphira, right? That's in Acts chapter 5, verse 11, 13 and 14. Ananias and Sapphira, look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Verse 13 says, And of the rest dared no man join himself to them, but people magnified them, and believers 
were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. When God purged the church of sin, did you notice how many people got saved? People started getting saved. God's spirit started moving again. Boy, the number one killer in the U.S., according to statistics, is cancer. The number one killer in church is what? Toleration and a lack of spiritual confrontation when it comes to people's sin that are living in open sin. Now, I'm not talking about hearsay, and, and I'm not talking about how the Lord has an opportunity to deal with you privately. I'm talking about, we're talking about sin that's now public, that's made of people, now it's spilling over into the church. The church is aware of it, and no one's doing nothing about it. This is what we're talking about. Now, I think he did. Well, he could have done it. No. When you go to a courtroom, is that what the lawyer says? Well, this is Mr. So-and-so, and we think that he did something. Is that what they say? No. So we're talking about factual, actual transgressions. Amen? According to the Word of God. So, um, Hebrews chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when you look at all that, man, it all deals with reconciliation and restoration. Galatians chapter 6 teaches us the private steps that we are to go through before we even approach a brother or sister that has sinned against us. God wants you to look at yourself inwardly first. And then he gives to us Matthew 18 and says, now these are the outward steps that you take. But make sure you take the steps of Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, before you even attempt Matthew 18 and go to your brother privately and all those things. And we're going to talk about all these things as we move through this text. Are you with me? All right. So um, a long time ago, I was in a church as a youth pastor. And, man, I was brand new, man, I hot off the press, boy. And there was a stink in this church, and the deacons had issues with the pastor. Well, the pastor was godly. It was the deacons that were ungodly. They were wrong. And for whatever reason, I got pushed into this meeting and said, hey, you need to come in here and, and share some scripture. And, and I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm a youth pastor. What? No, you're a pastor, man. You, you get in there. <laughs> so it was trial by fire, boy. And, man, I tell you what, son, they wanted to hang him, son. It was a posse. It was just ungodly. Oh, it was horrible, horrible, man, what they did to him. And, uh, and I called my friend, my singles pastor, Dan Dumas, and um, I learned more under him in three years than I would have probably 10 years somewhere else. Seriously, he was awesome. Well, he, I said, brother, I need help, man. So he gave me this outline. So I'm letting you know up front. He gave me this outline. Well, then later on, about 10 years go by, right, I'm, I'm studying, man, I'm looking, and I get a John MacArthur commentary of Galatians chapter 6, and guess what? That's where he got the outline from. I was like, okay. Anyway, I just wanted you to know up front, all right? And I said, hey, I'm not going to change it because it's a great outline, and it, it helps us follow the Scripture the way it does. And so, but this is what I had to walk that church through, and so it's important that we know how to get along when people hurt us and sin against us. Amen? Boy, because a lot of people walk around frustrated and bottled up. Or what they'll do is they'll do the opposite and go tell everybody else but the person they got a problem with, and that's a problem. That creates a million more problems. Would you agree? Amen. All right. So first of all, verse 1. Notice what it says. Brethren, if a man be overtaken or caught in a fault, in a sin. So the first thing that you have to do with a believer that you see that's in sin, that's struggling, that's not repenting, is number one, you pick them up. Or let's say they're struggling with it and they want to repent. They're trying to repent, but they're struggling. Number one, you pick them up. Uh, they need assistance. It's like, you know, somebody falls down, they call an ambulance. Sometimes, you know, God's going to call on you to be an ambulance for somebody else who's hurting, who's fallen, who's struggling in something. So we're to pick them up. Now notice, those who are spiritual, boy, those who are spiritual, and this is a, a confrontation now, the qualifications of one who are spiritual. Who, what are the qualifications of someone who is spiritual? Now remember what book we're in. We're in Galatians chapter 6, but if you back up to Galatians chapter 5, God tells us who qualifies as being spiritual. Does he not? Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And look at verse 16. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not what? Now what is the lust of the flesh? Who can tell me? Well, it says it right there, look. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such a like of these which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, they which do such things, practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So, if you look at verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fault, you which are spiritual... You which are spiritual. Who who qualifies as being spiritual now that we just read what Galatians chapter 5 said? Yes. That doesn't mean a pastor. doesn't mean Billy Graham. It means you. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're controlled by the Spirit. What does Ephesians 5.18 say? Be filled with the Spirit. It means to be under the control, under the total influence, the control of the Holy Spirit. How do you know when somebody's drunk? You would say, that, that person right there is not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with spirits, right? But how do you know that? Because of their actions, right? Well, the, man, you're going to know when somebody's filled with the Spirit of God. And God says, you're only going to be qualified to confront a brother or sister that has hurt you or that is in sin or you see is going out of the way. You're only going to be qualified to go to that person if you are truly under the control of the Holy Spirit. Why? God clearly tells us because you're not the doctor. You're not the one that can help this. You're not the one that's going to put it back together. You're not the one that can fix it. You're incapable of doing it. Only the Holy Spirit in you is the doctor that can properly confront somebody with their sin or their problem. That's why you have to be filled, controlled by the Spirit of God. Amen? All right. Um. <clears throat> The Bible says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly indwell you. Why would God say that? Why does God want his word to richly indwell you? Now, I know these are very basic questions, but, but, uh, but answer the question. Protection? Yes. And what is the sword of the Spirit? The word of God. So if I have a sword in the scabboard, is that going to help me defend myself? Or offend myself? No. You gotta have that thing out. That's why you gotta have it in your heart. I asked my kids the other day, I said, if if, if we were living in Nazi Germany and you were taken to a concentration camp and you were made to work and they were gonna work you to death like they did some of those people, how much of the Bible would you have to get you through that time in your heart? Because I guarantee you, Himmler, he hated Christians, he hated Christianity, and he wanted to exterminate it, eradicate it. That was one of the goals of the Germans, to, to eradicate Christianity off the planet. Boy. Hmm. Can anyone qualify? Well, I'm 50 years old, so therefore I've, I've got the ability to confront that person because I'm older and wiser. No, absolutely not. You've got to be filled with the Spirit, man. You have to be. Boy, we're responsible, all of us. Amen. And we're all, we're all subject to discipline, too. The spiritual believers are, to, for, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 14, listen to what it says now. This is why you have to be filled with the Spirit, because if you're not, you're going to be like a donkey or a bull in a china shop. Boy, listen to what it says. Admonish, confront the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. And in another verse, it says, bear with the scruples of others. Now, we're not talking about scruples. We're talking about real, actual, factual sin. Hey, man, you're in adultery. You're living in sin. You're in our church. This is unacceptable. You need to repent, right? Scruples is hanging out with people that just have little quirks about them that maybe you don't like so much. But that's not, we're not talking about it. The Bible says bear with one another's scruples. Man, dear Lord, ask Brother Brad. Hang out with me. I'll drive you nuts. Where's my keys? Where's my wallet? Where's this? Where's that? You know? And so I'm wasting people's time by asking them to help me find what I'm responsible for. So that is irritating. Amen? I, I freely admit it. Boy. But we're not talking about things that irritate us. We're talking about real sin here. Amen? Now, we're not to be suspicious and inquisitive. We're not to put the hat on and say, I'm Holy Spirit number two. Have you ever met that person in church? Oh, I met that person. Boy, son. Oh, I met that person. I met them a few times, man. And they're no fun, trust me. Uh, they're like a Pharisee. Now, 
Now look at, look at verse 1. This is a very interesting word. See that word restore there? Now if I can say it correctly, please forgive me if I don't. But the re- word restore there is katarizo in the Greek. And when you look up that word, it means to mend, to repair, or literally it means to set a bone back that's been broken. Now, let me ask you a question. Is anybody in this room a, a, a qualified medical doctor that has a, a, real, a real degree as being a medical? Anybody? All right, so if I were to ask you to, to put my bone back, would you do it? you be like, Brother Dave, you don't want me doing that, so that I'll make it 10 times worse, right? You want someone that's what? Qualified. Who's qualified to, to, to deal with sin and brokenness and, and the hurt and all the stuff that comes from it? Who's qualified to, to, to deal with it? Jesus. That's why you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You who are spiritual, under the total control of the Holy Spirit, you go and restore such a one because it's the Spirit of God in you that's going to be doing it, not you. Amen? Hebrews 12, 12, 13. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Wow. He alone is qualified. The Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, we are, you know, if I were to come to you and, and take a hammer and smack your pinky toe with it, you think you might have a problem with me? <laughs> right? Do you think your body's going to have a problem with that? Well, that little pinky toe is insignificant as we would say it is as far as body parts go. But boy, it becomes real significant when that thing gets smacked though, don't it? And what does it cause a person to do when somebody gets their toes smacked with a hammer? It causes them to walk not in a normal way. It affects the whole body. That's why we just read, man, listen, we are baptized into one body. And if one member suffer, all the members suffer. That's why sin has to be out of the church. It cannot exist. It cannot have room to grow. It can't be ignored. It can't be pushed in a corner. And that's where church splits happen because there's a lot of immature people in church that don't understand the law of spiritual confrontation when it comes to people and their sin. God has a formula for dealing with that. And we're going to look at what that formula is so we do it the right way, the correct way. So if somebody's living in adultery and it gets to the point in Matthew 18 where you got to tell the whole church about it and then you, you put them out of the church, what does God say? How do you treat that person? Like, a, like, 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 a, like, like they're your enemy and you, you, can't, you despise them and hate them? Who was the most despised in, in, in Jesus' day? At all the, at all the disciples, apostles or, or disciples, who do you think was probably the most despised at all of them? Not, not Paul. Let's go back. Not, not talking about Paul. Let's, let's go back. Looking at the original. Who? Well, now Judas at first, he, he, man, he was praised by everybody, right? He had everybody dupe. But Matthew was a tax collector. Can you imagine that, man? You're, you're our own people. You're a Jew. And you're extorting from me to help. Oh, boy. Son. And what did he say? When you kick somebody out of the church that way or you, 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 you excommunicate them temporarily... It's, it's to restore them. It's to get them to see their sin. It's to get them to see the error of their way. It's to get them to say, hey, we're not, we're not for you because God is against you because you're in sin. And if you repent, we'll restore you. Like the word of God says, you're to bring him back in the fold. But as a process, you're doing it for a reason. But he says to the person that does get kicked out of the church that you're to treat them evangelistically. Well, how do you treat somebody that's lost? You love them to Christ. Amen. Amen. So it's not to hurt them, it's to help them see the air of their way, keep the church pure so that that influence doesn't get into everybody else's system. Amen? Yes, indeed. Now, sin affects people three ways. How does it affect people? Well, does, does sin affect the believer himself? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? That includes me, even though I'm saved, right? So sin affects fellowship with God? right our joy our peace with god uh it weakens our anticipation of christ when we have sin in our life how do i know because it says in first john 2 28 abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming boy so sin affects our fellowship with the lord and if your sin affects your fellowship with the lord i guarantee you your sin affects your fellowship with everybody else on this planet because if you're not right with God, you cannot be right with anybody else. 
And if you're not right with somebody else, you are not right with God. That's crystal clear in the Word of God. We'll see that as we move through this as well. But sin also affects God directly, does it not? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, it talks about a person who, is, who has the Spirit of God that's saved, who joins himself to a harlot, becomes one flesh with her. And you're bringing the Lord, who the Bible says the body was not made for fornication. It wasn't made for immorality. It was made to serve the Lord. And then, man, and then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, boy, he, he gives a stern warning to people that want to fornicate, that want to live outside the confines of one man, one woman, and holy matrimony before a holy God according to the laws of the land, doing it right, doing it proper. The Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled, but the fornicator and the adulterer God will judge. Boy, so our sin affects God. You're bringing God into that union. Oh, boy, that's why the Bible says every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but he who fornicates sins against his own body. People wonder where gonorrhea and AIDS and all this horrible disease has come from. Man, it comes from violating God's word. Isn't it interesting that Ecclesiastes says, he whoever runs through a hedge of bushes really quick without looking will get bit by a serpent? I look at God's law as loving limits. And when we want to break through that hedge without looking, there's a serpent out there called Satan wanting to bite you. Amen? Boy. So our sin affects God. Uh, listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. It is not the cup of blessing. This is talking about the Lord's Supper. It is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ is not the bread we break a sharing in the body of Christ. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and demons, can you? No, you can't. You can't, ming you can't intermingle the two, amen? Boy, uh, people got sick, people were made weak, and some people died because they did not do the Lord's Supper properly and didn't repent and didn't, and didn't look at their own heart. God gives us a chance to, to repent, examine ourselves, get right with him so that he doesn't have to do it, amen? Boy, you know, sin, like lying sins against the what? The truth of God, right? Because God is truth, right? Man, uh, every sin that we commit is a direct assault against the character and nature of God, first and foremost. Your sin is an affront to him, first and foremost, and then to everybody else, amen? Boy. All right, let's move on. All right, sin also affects others. So it affects you as a believer, it affects God, and it affects other people. So that's why he is so serious about sin because of what it does. And its tentacles have a way of just getting in there and just, boy, latching on. So how do we do it? How do we approach? How do we do it? Well, how do we confront somebody who has hurt us or that we see that's not living correctly, that's going to affect the church or hurt, hurt themselves, hurt their family, hurt their witness? All right, well, look at verse 1. Notice what it says. In the spirit of what? Meekness. Now, who can tell me what meekness means according to the Greek? Mm, it's, it's that, but it's something different. Gentle. Anybody else? Yes. Power under control. Now, who has all power? God does. And it's perfectly, praise the Lord, under control. Because when power is out of control, man, just study, study Nazi Germany, and you'll see, what, you'll see the end of what, what happens there. Boy, power out of control. So praise God, he's in control. But we're, we're to do it in the spirit of being. So in other words, you're to have power under control. So in other words, you have the ability, as it says in Proverbs 18, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? You have the power to share the gospel. That brings eternal life to people. But the Bible says you also have the power of death in your tongue, and you can take your tongue and burn a life down with it, right? So it says in the spirit of meekness, that's why it's so critical that we follow these inward steps before we confront somebody that hurts us or that we see in sin so that we don't mess it up and make it worse. Are you with me? How not to do it? And Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, you know, being prideful, combative, uh, envying one another, um, Man, when you look at James chapter 4, 11, you know, judge not, least you be judged. Of course, it says that in Matthew 7. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, if you want to judge your brother, then you become a critic of the law. There's only one lawgiver, the Bible says, one lawgiver, one lawmaker, and a judge of it. And it's not me and you. It's the Lord. Amen? 
So he goes, you know, why do you, why do you criticize your brother? When you need to look at yourself and realize, man, you are made of the same stuff, you are tempted the same way, and you don't have a right to have an attitude. Now, when you've heard people say, judge not, least you be judged, have you ever heard anybody say that? That's probably one of the number one verses taken out of context. What does it really mean? Who can tell me? When the Bible says, when Jesus says, judge not, least you be judged, but if you do judge, you better judge with righteous judgment, the Bible says. So what does it mean to judge not, least you be judged? Does that mean when a cop catches a thief red-handed stealing from your house, and then the thief looks at the cop and says, judge not, least you be judged? Can't take me to jail. You can't judge me. Who are you to judge me? Is that what it means? No. What does it mean? It means that you cannot have a condemning, I'm better than you, I'm holier than you, I'm superior than you attitude when you confront somebody about their sin in other words you can't come to somebody and say hey man you're in sin this is wrong and man and and you deserve what you got coming to you boy boy god says man the same measure that you judge that same attitude that same you think you're better than people god will measure it back to you and you're going to get shown the same attitude to teach you a lesson that you can't be like that you can't walk around with a big log in your eye beating people's heads uh, up with it when you got to take you got to take that out of your eye and then take the splinter out of your brother's eye amen so when it says judge not at least you be in other words don't have an attitude that you're better than somebody man you, you got to come humbly like lord i'm a dirt clod you tell me in the word, dust thou art, and dust thou shall return. And Lord, without your Holy Spirit in me, I'm a dirt clod. I'm a wicked, hell-bound sinner, period. And anything, that, anything above going to hell is nothing but the grace and the sweet, sweet mercy of God in my life. Who are you to have an attitude that thinks you're better than somebody? That aristocratic snobbery. Boy, man, God despises it. Amen? And if you've ever been shown snobbery, you probably despise it too. Amen? And the spirit of meekness. Boy, listen to Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Look what it says. For if a man think himself to be something... Now, have you ever met anybody that thought they were something special? You ever met anybody like that? Oh, I met some in school where the mama comes and thinks that their precious little angel just floated down and just blessed everybody unaware in the classroom. Boy. Had horns on their head, boy. Holding up that halo. For if a man think himself to be something, so God clearly tells us, listen, when he is nothing, nothing, you're nothing, he deceiveth himself. What did Jesus say? You can do apart from, what does that mean? It literally means you, can, you can't exist, you can't breathe, you can't take your next step unless God allows it, period, period. Boy, the Pharisees were conceited. And you're going to get yourself into all kinds of trouble when you come to somebody. You confront them combatively. You come to them with anger. You come to them not considering yourself, least you to be tempted. In other words, God is saying, like, open your trunk and look at all the junk in there. Get all that cleaned out first. Get your eyes off everybody else's junk and deal with yours first. And then go confront your brother after you understand who you are, who I, the Lord, am in that perspective. Amen? Boy. Um. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. He gives a big long list of sins. What's the first sin that he hates on that list? Pride. Pride. Boy, boy. And we are to restore people, not condemn them, not hurt them. That's why gossip is such a wicked thing. That's why he says in Romans that people that gossip are worthy of death because, man, all gossip does is stir the pot. It's not there to help somebody. All it does is condemn somebody and get other people on your side to look down on them as well he who would love life and see good days let him reframe his tongue from speaking evil and his lips from speaking guile in other words god says you want to get along life you want to see you want to love good days boy you better keep that tongue in check and how you talk about people and how you approach people about their 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 stink when you got stink in your own life too amen now he's not saying don't confront them absolutely confront them but make sure you do it the right way in the right heart in the right spirit with the right attitude. Why? Because God wasn't is for us. He's not against us. Did he come to put everybody in hell? Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. He wants people saved, not hurt, not beat down, not condemned. Amen. And how much more should we have that heart in us? Because when he tells us in Corinthians that we are ministers of reconciliation ourselves. 
We're ambassadors of Christ. We represent him. Could you imagine an ambassador of Christ, uh, man, clubbing somebody? And Pastor Dave out there in the parking lot, you pull up and I'm, I've got a two by four and I'm beating somebody over the head with it. I mean, would that be a good example to you? No, at all. In other words, God is saying, never forget where you come from. Man, just realize all it takes is one sin to put you in hell. That's all it took. And every other sin after that is going to add to your damnation. Boy. In the spirit of meekness, man, the fruits of the spirit, man. Look at Philippians 2, 3. It says, let nothing be done through strife. I'm not going to you mad and ticked off and just, mm, I'm going to let you have it. What does the Bible say? With many words, what does it say in Proverbs? With many words, what? Sin is not lacking. Boy, you want to just vent? The Bible says a fool vents all of his emotions. Boy, and, and with many words, sin is not lacking. Wow. Let nothing be done through strife or pride, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look at, look at verse 4 of Galatians chapter 6. But let every man what? Examine or prove or test himself. What does that mean? In other words, Lord, is my attitude right? Do I have the right attitude about, about going to this brother? Do I really want to see this person restored? Am I here to help them? Or, or am I here to broadcast to everybody what they did? Boy, is your life right before God? Have you truly confessed your sins before God one by one? The Bible says in, for, in, in first, uh, first John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins plural, we confess them personally, we confess them plurally, right? Sins plural. And we're to do it persistently, the Bible says in that verse as well. So in other words, you don't have to have a sin list in your life. If you're aware of a sin, you need to get rid of it and repent of it. Amen? And when repentance is always in the Greek. It's always immediately, right now, present tense. Boy. But let every man examine himself. So before going and attempting to give spiritual help to others, man, boast in what the Lord's done. Man, consider what he's done for you. Consider the, the pit that he pulled you out of. Amen? Boy. All right, so we're to pick them up. But number two, Roman number number two, we're to also, once we pick them up, confront them in a spiritual way, and we talk about their sin, let's say they repent, then we're to hold them up. Let's say they repent and say, okay, you're right. You know what, I repent. They do it. Then the Bible teaches us now, the second step in restoring them is to hold them up, not just pick them up and then walk away and say, okay, you're good to go. Man, have fun. Man, I'm, I'll be praying for you. No, you're to, you're, to, you're to challenge them. You know, you're to, hey, man, how, how you doing with that particular uh, issue that you've been having? Or how you doing with that particular weakness, that sin that's so easily is besetting you? How, how you doing with that? You're to come to them, hold them up. Look at verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So it's not enough to help him or her from sin and then leave them alone. Man, Satan comes after spiritual victories, does he not? Have you ever had Satan come to you? After spiritual victory, boy, you have a tendency to let your guard down after spiritual victories, don't we? I have one man said, he goes, an unguarded strength in your life is a double weakness. We have a tendency to pray to the Lord in areas where we're weak, but we have a tendency to be tempted to lean, and lean on ourselves in areas that we're very comfortable with, that we're strong with. But an unchecked strength is a, is a double weakness, boy. Even your strength has to be given to the Lord, amen, because they're weak in his view, in his eyes. So hold them up. Look at verse 2. Bear you one another's burdens. Now that word burden there means uh, it's too heavy for one person to carry. It takes two people to carry the burden that the Greek is talking about, like a boulder. It's too big. Hey, this guy has fallen. He's in sin or she's in sin. So we pick them up, and now we're going to hold them up. So in the context, burden here means that the sinning believer is going to be tempted to fall back into the same sin. You've heard it said by doctors, a broken leg or a broken bone can, can break twice as easily because it's lost some of its strength. Well, when a believer sins, does that mean that they're not going to sin again? Does that mean they're not going to be tempted to sin again? So that's what it means. You, you can be there for accountability to help them with their problem. Hey, man, you, 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 you're tempted to smoke. Well, do you have any cigarettes in your house? Well, yeah, I got a carton. Hey, get rid of it. Get out of your out of it so you're, you're not tempted by it. Get rid of it, amen? Hey, brother, you got a problem with pornography? Well, then take your computer and either throw it in the trash or put it in the middle of the living room so God and everybody that in your house can see what you're, what you're typing and what, and what you're looking at. You got to be accountable to people. 
I remember one believer, there was a big, big board with a, with a half-naked woman on it. He would literally drive 10 miles out of the way so he wouldn't have to look at that billboard because he was tempted by it. He was, it was a weakness for him. I would say that's a weakness for a lot of men. All men. Boy. That's why God addresses men to look upon a woman's lust after her in your heart to commit adultery already. Boy. Boy, you're not to look at women as, as a, a property or meat or something to satisfy or fulfill your lust on. No, Jesus died for them. Amen? I try to teach my kids, listen, your mother is a daughter of God. How does God want me to treat her? How would you want somebody dating your daughter to treat your daughter? Right? Man, my wife's a daughter of God. How does God expect me to treat her? Boy, are you with me? So to be free from a sin is not always to be free from its temptation is what the Lord's teaching us. You agree with that? Amen. Now notice what it says. Love your neighbor as your what? Fulfill the law of Christ. How do you do that? By loving your neighbor as you love yourself. By loving God first with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. Now did you ever notice most people skip over the mind part, loving God with all your mind? Okay, so if I'm thinking wrong about somebody... And I've got hate in my heart towards them. Or I got an attitude towards them. Or I'm 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 looking at them as, as less than somebody. Boy, I got a problem with God. The Bible says the thinking of folly is sin. Did he not say in Genesis chapter six, because their thinking was continually evil, the flood came? Because if you're thinking wrong, then man, it's gonna bear out in your body. Your actions are also gonna be wrong. It's gonna come out. So if you lose a battle in your mind, you're going to lose the battle in your body. It's going to come out. Boy. So love your neighbor basically as yourself. Men, the Bible says men are always to pray. Uh, we're to encourage one another so much more as the day draws near, according to Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Don't forsake the assembling of the brethren as some have the habit of doing. James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The Bible says in Psalm 5, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Uh, man, he constantly is using people to help other people. Are you with me? So we're to hold them up. We're to, man, we're to pick them up, but we're to hold them up. We're to help keep them accountable. Hey, man, are you reading? Hey, man, how's your thought life? Hey, it's always good to try to find someone that you can really trust, and I know that's a rare, rare gem today. But if, you, if God does give you the fortune or the blessing to, to be able to put a good friend on your one hand, that you can really talk to, man, it's good to, man, hey, I want you to challenge my thought life. I have a guy that, hey, brother, you can come look at my computer anytime you want. Hey, brother, you can ask me anything you want. And then we have, we also have a habit of, of the last question being, now, have you lied to me at any time? Have you lied to me during this time that I've asked you any of these questions? Have you lied to me? Things like that. But that's rare to find people like that. But, but, but when you know somebody, you check up on them, you hey, man, how you doing? Are you doing all right? You doing okay? Yes, indeed. So we're to um, also number three now. We're to build them up. After you pick them up, you hold them up. The Word of God teaches us we're to build them up. Well, how do we do that? Well, look at verse six. Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. In the Greek, let me read it to you this way. Let him who receives instruction share it with him who gives instructions in all good things. Boy, so the word share here means to fellowship. Paul's talking about... Um, uh, mutuality uh, not one party doing doing it all doing all the serving but they're doing it equally so we're to build them up notice what it says in verse 5 for every man shall bear his own burden now there's, a, there's that same word again burden but this in the Greek is a different word the first bird was like a boulder that it took two people to pick up because he was in sin but now the word of God is telling now the person that you've you helped pick them up and you've helped hold them up now you're in the process of building them up and this is what the Lord says to us for every man shall bear his own burden so the person that is being picked up and helped up needs to understand that you also have a burden to bear on your own and these people can't bear all of your burden for you what does that mean notice it says good things man and all good things boy in, in uh, that verse, verse 6, in all good things, means sharing and doing the word of God. We're to build them up in the word of God. We're to build them up with God's instruction. Amen? Are you with me? 
for every man shall bear his own load. In other words, I can't do your praying for you. I can't do your quiet time for you. I can't do your personal reading for you. I, I, can't, I can't be uh, your person that tells you how to be obedient every second of the day. No, you got your own responsibility to the Lord, so please take ownership of that. Because what happens is some people, man, they love it when people are helping them and picking them up, and, and, and what happens is that they become their surrogate God. And you are not designed far from it. You're not, period. Satan will tell you that you're a God, but you're not. You're a human being that needs Jesus, the one true God. Amen? Boy, so good things, sharing and doing the word of God together. You're to, you're to help build them up. All right, now let's move on. I got a little bit left. Let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18. All right, are there any questions or any comments about Galatians chapter verses 1 through 6? I know I kind of flew through that, guys. I don't want to do that. So if you have any questions, hey, brother, I don't understand something. Now, whatever it is, man, there's no such thing as a bad question about the Bible, period, ever. And if anybody ever makes you feel bad, shame on them. Shame on them. Anybody have any questions? Insight, comments. I remember I was in a singles pastor, and there were these two people at odds with one another. Man, boy, at odds. Kind of like in Philemon, how those two ladies were at odds with one another. And I remember talking to them. And, man, I tell you what, man, the hurt and the pain that it caused everybody, all because of a simple misunderstanding. All because one person said, you know what? I don't want to do what Matthew 18 says and go privately and talk to my brother alone. No, that person went and told everybody else what happened. And that's what started it all. But, but by God's grace, two people that were at odds with one another, man, God fixed them, and they became almost like best friends, man. So I've seen God move, and that's God's heart. He wants to reconcile. You've you got to believe that. You've got to believe that God wants your relative that you talk to that just doesn't want nothing to do with Christ. Maybe my, my dad, when my brother went to go talk to my dad, my, my dad purposely cussed and purposely turned nasty television shows on just to see if he could get a reaction out of my brother. Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you go to people, man, how crucial is it, man, to be filled with the Spirit, amen, when you confront people about their, their, their junk because you got just as much junk in your trunk. And if you treat people and have a condemning spirit towards somebody, and you know, you know you're guilty of sin yourself, man, boy. Matthew 18 tells a story about a, a king who forgave a wicked servant of, of a debt that nobody could pay. Remember that story in Matthew 18? Boy, man, we're going to learn about what God says about forgiveness. So let me get through Matthew 18, guys. Let's see here. Mm-hmm. Let me get to uh, look at verse uh, 14 with me. It says, Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. All right? What is he talking about? Back up. Go over there to verse number uh, 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. Now, these little ones is not talking about little kids. He's talking about born-again believers. All right? No matter what age you are. He calls us little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So this is a verse, if you did want to know, if you have a guardian angel, it sounds like you might have a couple. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. How think you, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go, after, go into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? And if... So, be that he find it, verily, or truly, I say to you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine that went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Did you see that? Him alone. So here's what happens, and I'm going to show you. And when you go tell one person, I'm going to give you a list of sins that you're guilty of. Boy, it's serious, man. It's serious. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. 
But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. What in the mouth, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, then let him be unto thee as a heathen man or a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth, you shall loose in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, and it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, here's a verse that's way, way misquoted, way, way taken out of context. This is it right here. I've heard millions of people, well, let me back up. I've heard lots of people quote this verse. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I've got news for you. Jesus is in the midst of you if you're by yourself because he lives inside of you. What is he talking about? What is the context of verse 20 being said in? Look at verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take what? Take one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be what? Established. Now go back down to verse 20. For where two or three what? Are gathered together in my name. Doing what? Dealing with church discipline. Dealing with a brother or sister that's in sin. Not a Bible study and we're going to get around the piano and sing Kumbaya and say the Lord is in our midst because that's not how that verse is taught. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not beating anybody up. I get it. I get it, you know. Their heart's right, their intention's right when they quote that verse, but, but I want to teach you the right way. This verse has nothing to do with Bible studies. It has everything to do with church discipline and dealing with people who are in sin, who are out of the way and the will of God. Are you with me? All right. Now, divorce from biblical preaching, from daily living, is compromise of the worst sort. Would you agree with that? Why? Because it corrupts the church, man. When you divorce yourself from biblical preaching and say, I'm going to do it my own way, go my own way, or whatever it may be, man, I'm telling you right now, man, it's compromise of the worst sorts. Man, it corrupts the church. Man, it grieves the Lord. It dishonors his word, his name. Amen? And the word must be preached. The word must be taught. Amen? The word is sufficient, you know? I, I, all these people have... All these events, and I'm not against events and things like that, but buddy, when you have an event, you better preach the word of God, my friend. You better preach it because that's the only thing that is sufficient that's going to save somebody. It's not pizza and parties and your philosophy and all this other stuff. No, it's preaching the word of God. Amen? Jesus said, be ye holy for I'm what? Now, uh, God may still act in supernatural ways to purge his church, but he primarily is given the job of church purging uh, people who are guilty of actual, factual sin that's spilling over into the church. Who did he give that responsibility to? To us. Oh, that's why we're looking at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, the inward steps. And then he says, now once you get yourself together there, now I want you to go over there to Matthew 18 and do the outward steps. Do what I say. Because the Lord's going to be with you in this. Amen? Yes, he will be. Sin has to be dealt with or destroy both those who practice it and those who tolerate it. Amen? It destroys the one who practices it, and it will destroy and ruin those that tolerate it. Man. Contrary to proper belief, even amongst Christians, it's not love but indifference and disobedience that causes uh, parents to allow children's misbehavior. Would you agree with that? Oh, let me read that quote again, and I uh, forgive me for not quoting it. This is a quote. Um, it's not love but indifference and disobedience that causes parents to allow their children's misbehavior to go uncorrected. The Bible says in Proverbs, he who spares the rod, now people love to say spoil the child, now, does it spoil a kid? Yes, it does. But is that what God's word teaches? No. It doesn't teach spoil the child. What does God's word teach? Listen to what God says in that verse. People like to soften it down to spoil. No, 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 no. He who spares a rod hates his child. Hates his child. That's the Hebrew word. Wow. Why would God say that? He who spares a rod hates his child. Then the Bible goes on to say, discipline your son while there's hope. 
Spare not for their much crying, for you shall beat them, and they will not die, but you will deliver their soul from hell, from the grave. Boy, is what the Word of God says. Now, my dad believed in time out, enough time to take his belt off. <laughs> that, was, that was his version of time out. Boy, oh boy. Son, I knew where South was. It was right here. <laughs> and my dad was like, he, he, hey, you know what, man? I love my dad to death. Oh, I love him. Man, I respect him. I have utmost respect for my father. Man, the way he raised me, oh. But he was lost for 50 years of his life, but he still, he was like, like iron, but he was like velvet, too. He had a good balance of both. And he would, boy, he'd whip my tail, son. He'd go, now, son, I'll whip you again just as hard if you do it again. But then he'd put his arm around me and tell me he loved me, he cared for me, how it hurt him, how it grieved him, how he didn't want me to be like that. So he really, you know, he, he did it right. And you have to discipline right. But I'll tell you why God says you hate your child when you don't discipline a child. So we're talking about, you know, correcting people. Why? Because it produces respect. It produces reverence for God, right? But if you have a child that you don't control, who's going to want to babysit your kid? And then when your kid gets into a preschool or to the high school, who, who, who all the teachers dislike? That kid that's undisciplined because you hate your child by doing that. And you hate your child on a much greater scale is because, listen, when the Bible says honor your father and mother, who do you think that's for? Who do you think it's, who do you think it's directed to more so? Is it directed more to the kid or is it directed more to the parent? I would say equally, the child and the parent. Why? Because honor your father and mother well how, you, you got to be honorable to be honored right well if you honor god by being obedient then you're going to be honorable then your kid has a, a basis of what because listen your child is going to base his relationship with god based on how he has a relationship with you as a parent that's why god says live honorably honor your father and mother so in other words be parents like child dedications it's not so much for the child, it's for the parent. You know, listen, you're, a parent, you're dedicating yourself first and foremost to the Lord before you dedicate your child to the Lord. Amen? Hmm. Listen to this, and I quote. It's a strong illusion to think that the church can take a strong verbal stand against sin without enforcing the stand among its own members and at the same time expect them to go... Uh, go to uh, God's standards of holiness. Physical children do not respond to this approach and discipline, neither will spiritual believers. Amen? Boy. Matthew 18, verse 2, Jesus is teaching about childlikeness, how a child is saved, how you can enter into the kingdom of God. Um, you know, but again, now he's not talking about just small physical children. He's talking about everybody as well. Verses 5 and 9, they are to be protected like little children, cared for like little children. Uh, according to verses 10 through 14. Verse 15 through 20, Jesus said they must be disciplined like little children. And then Matthew 18, 14, thus it's not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish, be marred, be wounded spiritually, or hurt, or grieved. For it's better for what? For you to tie a millstone around your neck, God said. But do you hear what Jesus said? You know what a millstone was? You know how big those were? You ever seen a millstone? Boy, it was like a big stone donut, right? God said it would be better for you to put that around your neck and be cast into the sea than for you to lead anyone into any kind of sin. Wow. People forget, man, God's holiness is so stern. That's why he says in Ephesians, Behold the severity of the Lord and behold the mercy of the Lord. Boy, amen. You talk about severe Going to hell forever, that's severe. That's offensive to God. Amen? It gives you goosebumps. Man. Praise God for his grace. Amen? And praise God for lamentations that says we're not consumed because his mercy faileth not. Amen? Praise God. And praise God, man, we're, we're, we, are, we, are, we are made righteous now. We're not like the Old Testament saint where the Holy Spirit came and went. No, we have him permanently, and he permanently makes us righteous. Amen? Yes, he does. Well, let's just stop there, and we'll go over Matthew 18 and the following uh, as we, we go through this. Are there any questions so far about what we've covered?
I hope I wasn't like a fire hydrant. Was I like a fire hydrant? Are, are you, if I was, p- please forgive me. Why? I don't want to be like a fire My wife says, you're like a fire hydrant sometimes. People can only drink so much, Brother Dave. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Anything at all? Something you didn't understand? All right. But if you do, and you're just scared to raise your hand, then don't worry. Come to me privately, and we'll, we'll have a discussion. All right? All right, I'm going to ask my dear brother Brad if he'll close us in prayer. Thank you guys for your love and your patience with me.